All right, we are ready to get started. Actually, we're doing better than I thought we would do. When I um, was planning everything out this last Thursday for worship today, I knew we were passing the plate twice. I knew we had that five-minute video. And with all the announcements, I thought, I'm not sure we're really going to have class. But uh, I'm glad we pulled it off where we can at least get started. Turn your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we're going to be today. And uh, this is the beginning of the part on um, miracles, the uh, charisma, as you would do if you're talking about it in a technical term. Uh, charismatic is where we get our English charismatic from, is that idea of the gifts. 12, 13, and 14 talk about the gifts. What we're going to do, I think, in our class period I want us to go ahead and go on through because the context of 12 has a lot to do with 11. I want us to go ahead. We're going to study one week, chapter 12. One week, we're going to study chapter 13. And then one week, maybe a couple weeks, we're going to study chapter 14. And then once we're done with that, I want us to go back and talk about miraculous gifts. Uh, if you grew up in the Lord's Church, uh, maybe a few decades ago, you heard a lot of lessons on the full measure of the Spirit, partial measures of the Spirit. You remember that and how the Spirit was passed on and gifts were passed on and things such as that. Uh, maybe you remember that. It's not talked about as much anymore. So we're going to have a class period where we talk about that stuff. Miracles, why they don't happen today like they did in the first century. What's the difference between a miracle in the first century and a miracle today? And the uh, way in which they were passed on and the purpose they were passed on for, and uh, each one of the miraculous works and what their purpose was. We see the nine of them mentioned in chapter 12, and uh, we'll spend some time on that, but not as long as we will a few weeks later. But let's go ahead and start in chapter 12. And, and well, let's just go ahead and we'll get started. We're going to go to verse 11, but I might get distracted and just stop. All right, chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. This is New King James I'm reading out of. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however they were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay? All right, as he's introducing this section, he makes two things here. First of all, he says, remember the way you used to be. You used to follow after these idols, and you used to follow after this pagan form of worship, but now you have been led away from it. So he's making a point here. Your worship is going to look different. If you recall, when we first started 1 Corinthians, we did a, a little study of the context of the culture in that day. Remember the uh, canal that they would have? The reason Corinth was such a viable community and since it was so booming, was because of a canal that they had built. Really, they didn't build the canal until several centuries later. They had a trail or a road. And what would happen is products would come, slaves would carry it across that short area, it's about two miles, and then they would put it back on a ship. And if you went across that isthmus in that way, it saved you about a week and a half of travel if you went the whole way by boat. And so you could save a lot of money by going through Corinth. It was a shortcut. Well, by being in that way, it really made the population of Corinth boom. And if you've ever been in any of our seaport cities, you see the um, culture which is there. Uh, New Orleans, great culture, great food, not so great a morality, right? San Francisco, great culture, great food, not so great on, on morality, right? Uh, New York is a pretty big port. Uh, Boston's a pretty big port you kind of attract some pretty uh, seedy areas. That's a little bit of what Corinth is going through. Also, you have a lot of the paganism. The way in which they worship back at that time was very different than what we think of as worship. And that's true in the Old Testament and New Testament. A lot of sexual immorality and a lot of really weird, crazy stuff went on in their worship. And so somebody who grew up worshiping like that, you can imagine when they obeyed the gospel... They would expect weird things to happen and crazy things to happen. And that's one of the reasons why these miraculous gifts are being abused. And especially when we get to chapter 14, we'll see how they're being abused in these different ways. 
So Paul, first and foremost, says, remember, your worship is changed. You're not following after these dumb idols. When we say dumb, the word dumb for me means different than the word dumb for them back then. Uh, dumb today means, hey, somebody's just a nincompoop, not thinking through stuff, right? What did dumb mean back then? What's it mean to be deaf and dumb? Deaf is you can't hear, and dumb is what? Can't speak. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about idols. That, yes, they're dumb, stupid idols. But more, more importantly, these idols can't speak through you. That's what he's going through when he goes to that. Secondly, he repeats something which First John does quite a bit. And this is the early onset of Gnosticism. And we don't have enough time to go through that. But if anybody speaks in the church and he says Jesus is not Lord, what's that mean? It's not coming from the Lord, right? It's not coming from Jesus. So the first test, according to 1 John, to see if somebody's from God is that he admits that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So that's how he introduces it. All right, now verse 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Okay? There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversity of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Okay, four through six. What's the point he's getting across? Do you notice how I played with that word same? You got the Trinity going here, okay? And this is the earliest uh, recording we have of the Trinity in the New Testament, if you uh, date the uh, books together. Okay, Father, Son, and Spirit. He's saying, listen, there's going to be nine different gifts which are out there. There's a lot of different parts of the body and a lot of different things going on. But how many gods are there? One. How many Jesuses or Lords are there? One. How many spirits are there? One. Holy Spirit. And so while there's a lot going on, remember there is one God. Now what's that teach us today? There's a lot of things which happen in the church, but everything that happens in the church is for what purpose? It needs to be to glorify God. Uh, Orpheus Hayward, remember he did our gospel meeting. Uh, I had him that week come and speak to the uh, preacher's uh, luncheon. All the preachers of Marshall County get together. I think it's the last Tuesday of every month. We meet together and eat because that's what preachers do. And, um, you know, we get together and everything. And so Orpheus was talking to us and we were asking questions. And one of the questions we said is, you know, how, does, how do you get your church to grow You know, what are some of the things you work with? And he says, listen, what I do is everything in this church where I preach goes in one direction. I got a youth program. That youth program is for one purpose, to bring people into the church. Got a benevolence program. That benevolence program is for one purpose, to bring people in the church. Got a Bible class program. Got a ladies program. And he started going through it and he said, everything points to evangelism. And that's one of the things they, that's really one of the things they really emphasize in that church. Well, here at Benton, what needs to be our emphasis? Putting God first in everything we do. Youth group is great for them to have fun. Fellowship is super important, especially at that age. But everything the youth group does needs to be ultimately to glorify God. We have a vibrant, super vibrant um, uh, benevolence ministry. That pantry that works on Monday and all those other things. All that needs to work for, not just to feed the poor, but ultimately to glorify God. Everything needs to go in that direction. And so here in a little bit, you're going to have people speaking in tongues, people with prophecies, people with wisdom, people with gifts of healings, and all these different things. Paul is saying, listen, whatever you do, do it to the glory of the Lord. Don't speak these tongues in trying to bring glory to yourself. Do it to bring glory to God. To make everything, as 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, decently and in order. And so notice that word same, he's hammering that because he wants us to see that while there are many, it is all pointing towards one. All right, now verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, okay, that's number one. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of the spirits. To another, different kind of tongue. To another, the interpretation of the tongues. You see the nine there. But one and the same Spirit works in all these, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, verse 12. For as the body is one, it has many members. All members of that one body, being many, are one body. 
so also is Christ. All right, we'll get to that list there in just a second. But what he's coming across here is he says, listen, verse 7, the Spirit given to each one, each one has a different ability, but it's for the profit of whom? Everybody. You see, we're going back to the church, okay? All right. The one's given, the, and he goes through, and he says to one, to one, to another, to another. Let's go ahead and look through this list. And usually this is the inclusive list which is given. Another list is given in Mark 16. We'll look at that in a few weeks as well. All right, let me find where it's at here. I know I'm here. Oh, okay. These gifts include, number one, spiritual wisdom. What is wisdom? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Yeah, knowledge is knowing stuff. Wisdom is knowing how to put your stuff to use. Okay? Folks who work in factories, maybe folks who work in schools, maybe even folks who work in churches know this. Okay? Tell me if you've ever experienced this. You get a fella fresh out of college. Okay? Fella fresh out of college, he knows a whole lot more than you do. At least he thinks he does. Has anybody ever seen somebody like that? And he shows up, but his problem is, while he has all that knowledge, he doesn't know how to make it work. Right? He doesn't know how to put it to use. Some people have what we call book smart. They got all these book smarts, but they don't know you know, how to make all these things work. Uh, you know, I've met some people who, uh, man, they did great in school, and they did great in their languages, and they're great theologians, but they just can't preach because they can't put all that knowledge into words and make it to have any application to what a normal living being would ever have, right? Okay. That's knowledge. Knowledge is knowing the word, knowing the will of God. Wisdom is knowing how to put it into practice. Okay? So some people have great knowledge. In other words, this is not just, hey, I'm a smart dude. This is God giving them knowledge of, how, of uh, what the word of God is. Now, why would somebody need this in the first century to have a super illumination of this is what God wants me to do? Why would you need that in the first century? Before the book of 1 Corinthians was written, could they say, hey, let's look in 1 Corinthians 13 and study about love? Could they have done that? The Bible wasn't yet written. And so there were members of the church whom the apostles had laid their hands on who were given the ability to know these are the qualifications of elders. These are the qualifications of deacons. This is how we should do the Lord's Supper. This is what we mean when we talk about baptism. Because when Paul went on, there needed to still be teaching and learning done there. Okay, So you had to have that supernatural knowledge which was there until the Bible was written. You can see that. Now secondly, you had to have wisdom. Now why would a person need a supernatural measure of wisdom in the first century? Were there a lot of questions and disputes that would come up? What were these people just converted out of? Dumb idolatry, right? These idolatry, and that was everything that they were used to. You had to have wisdom to know, hey, you know, we shouldn't do that, but we should go this way and make this choice. And we should have this choice in that way. Okay, supernatural faith. Is that important? Yes, you need to be able to have that faith which is there. Now, many of these were given to different people. The ability to heal, okay. Now, why did they heal people in the New Testament? When Jesus went around healing folks, what was the reason? That's right. Glorify God and confirm the word. In Mark 3 or 4, when they come and bring the lame man and tear apart the house and drop the man down there, remember the guy with the four friends that dropped him? <coughs> that lame man showed up right there at the feet of Jesus. What did Jesus tell him? Did he say you're healed? No. What did he start off with? Your sins are forgiven. And everybody thought in their minds, he can't forgive sins unless he's God. And so Jesus says, what's he harder for you to say? You know, it's actually the same number of words in Greek. What's harder for you to say? And he said, listen, whether your sins are forgiven or you're healed, 
Both of them are just as easy for me to say. And he says, watch this. Take up your mat and walk. And the guy got up and walked out. What was that proof of? Jesus can heal him of his physical problems. Jesus can heal him of his spiritual problems as well. When Jesus heals the person at the pool of Siloam, what's the purpose of it? Especially in John 9 also. What's the purpose of it when he heals that man who is lame? To show that he is the Messiah. The gift of healing was not just to walk into a hospital and fix everybody. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus used that occasion to prove that what he was saying was true. So in the New Testament, people had this gift of healing, which was there. Okay, uh, Working of miracles, doing great things like that. Prophecy. What is prophecy? It means to tell forth. It's not always telling the future, but it's telling the word of God. And we see there are prophets, Agabus. Remember Agabus? The man who bound Paul, his hands and feet, said this is what's going to happen to you if you go back to Jerusalem. Okay, discerning the spirits. Why would you need to be able to discern spirits? What's it mean to discern? Tell the difference. Okay, yes. To tell the difference if you're a Kentucky or a Louisville fan. Just kidding. I know we have a lot of Louisville fans. And Kentucky fans, too. All right. To tell us what somebody's up there saying is true or not. When you hear a preacher to know, man, that is wrong. Or to hear a preacher know, yo, man, that is right. Now, why is that important in the first century? They didn't have this, did they? Now, the Bereans in Acts 17 were counted noble. Why? They searched the scriptures to see if those things which were written or those things which were said were true. But that's the purpose of what we're working with there. Okay? And so you had the discerning of the spirits. The ability to speak different languages and the ability to interpret those different languages. Oh, my. I could have used that in high school. could have used that in college, too. If you just had the ability to hear these sayings and be able to interpret these things. Now, what's the purpose of tongue speaking? I used to think it was so that they could go wherever. Did y'all get one of these? I used to think it was so you could go wherever and they could hear what you were saying and understand in their own language. And, and that's true to a sense. You see that in Acts chapter 2. But tongue speaking was for outsiders so that you could speak in their language and they could see from your accent and your looks something's wrong here. Something is weird. And you see in Acts 2 where they heard them speaking in their own language and they thought, this is crazy. These guys are Galileans. And then they were attracted to hear the gospel. That's why in chapter 14 we're going to say tongue speaking is for non-Christians and prophecy is for Christians. That's one of those things. Tongue speaking were, was not just so that Paul could go preach in a German congregation and fit right in. It was to attract non-Christians and bring them to the faith. Okay? And of course if you have a tongue speaker, what also do you need? An interpreter at all times, right? There's a... Uh, Preacher from days past, and I'm not going to tell you his name because it's a little crass what he did. He would go to these uh, Pentecostal uh, events, and somebody would start prophesying and speaking in a tongue like they'll do. You know, somebody will stand up and just, bah, da, 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 you know, make all sorts of weird noises. What this preacher would do is stand up and he'd say, I'm interpreting for him. His mama is ugly. He'd listen a little longer. His feet stink, and he'd go a little longer. And uh, the guy would keep going. Somebody would say, well, that's not what he's saying. Shut up. And he'd say, I'm interpreting. You know, prove to me I can't interpret what he says. Well, they're trying to do this uh, ecstatic utterances, trying to say, hey, God's working through me. And he would stand up and say, hey, I'm going to interpret. And he would just come up with the craziest stuff to ever say. Um, not exactly what I would recommend for you to do. Don't go to a Pentecostal service and tell somebody their mama's ugly. But um, he was trying to make a point towards them. And trying to make a point that when you speak, you're not supposed to speak unless you have an interpreter. And so he was standing up saying, I'm their interpreter. And he was just coming up with crazy stuff there. So, you know, attitudes are a lot different today than they were a generation or two ago. But that's one of those things that's always stuck in my mind that's always been there. All right. Any comment on miracles? Like I said, we're going to cover a little bit more, probably about three or four weeks. Knowing me, 10 weeks, but hopefully we won't be that way. Hopefully we'll get there. Okay. All right. Now, as you look from 12, verses 12, excuse me. Yeah, 12 and 13. 
For the body is one, many members, all the members of the body are one body. Being many are one body, so is Christ. Now look at verse 13. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. All have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. All right, remember the point of what we're going through here. Sometimes we get looking so close that we don't stand back. What did he say at the beginning? There is how many lords? One. How many gods? How many spirits? Holy spirits? One. One. Three and one. That's what they're doing. All right. He says there's many, many, many diversity of spirits, many, many, many diversities of gifts, but there is one God. Now, here's his first illustration. He says, every one of you were baptized into what? One body. Okay? These people, and we're going to get to especially chapter 14, they're saying, hey, I can speak in tongues, and so I'm better than everybody else because this is a really cool gift. And other people are saying, hey, I have prophecy. You know, I can get up and preach, and God is moving me to preach, and I've got all this wisdom or knowledge or whatever else it may be, so I'm better. And today in the Lord's church, we tend to rank ourselves as well. Some people say, hey, you know, I grew up in this church. I've got two or three or four generations in this church, that sort of thing. Other people will say, hey, listen, you know, my family, uh, you know, we're deacons or we're elders or we're preachers. And so, you know, hey, we're pretty important around here. And other people say, man, you know, there's a lot of zeros in that check I put in the contribution plate. I am a big giver here, so I am pretty important. All right. That's what Paul is getting after. Paul is getting after those who say they're better than everybody else. And so the point he puts here, first of all, he's like, he says, listen, whatever your gift is, it came from the same place, the same God. Now, the second point is you are baptized into one body. You may be a Jew, you may be a Greek, you may be slave, you may be free. You are baptized into one body. This is one of the ways I know I am equal to everybody else in this church. Outside of Christ, I'm a what? I'm a sinner. I was baptized raised to walk in newness of life, and now that I am in Christ, I'm a what? I'm a Christian. I'm a saint. Okay? Every single one of us, if we're in Christ, has gone through the same thing. I'm not saved because I give more money. I'm not saved because I do more works. I'm not saved because of my last name or because of my heritage. I'm not saved because I'm popular. I'm saved by the blood of Christ. And every single one of us, from the most important person in church to the very least person in church, we were saved in the exact same way. And we stand in the exact same body. And we are in the exact same relationship with God. It's a little bit of equality there, isn't it? Or maybe a lot of bit of equality. We are the same. Now he's going to illustrate it a little bit more. Here's your body illustration. I like this. Um, the foot, man, that foot feels bad. Look at verse 15. The foot says, hey, I'm not a hand. I'm not part of the body. Is it not therefore part of the body? Okay. Your feet aren't this way. But my feet stink. Okay. I go camping with the boys. They have learned to put their heads close to where my heads are, head is in the tent because my feet don't smell good. All right. Now, my feet may feel bad one day and say, listen, I'm not a hand. I smell pretty bad. You know, my master always puts me in a sock. It's pretty much of a bummer. All right. Is your foot still part of the body, even if it's not as popular? Okay. Would you be happy if you lost your feet? No. We may be embarrassed about toenails or whatever else, Paul may say, but you want your feet around. The foot shouldn't look around and say, man, I'm not a hand. I don't belong. Okay. Same with the ear. If the ear should say, hey, I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Okay? An ear may feel bad because it doesn't feel like it's doing as much as the eye does. Do any of us want to be without our ears? Oh, we want to hear, right? And so that's what Paul is saying is don't look around at the church and say, man, I, I can't preach or I'm not an elder or I don't have the money to give like that person, so I really don't belong. Paul says, listen, if you're attached to the body, you are important to God. He wants you in the body. You matter to him. All right? 
But then he pulls it from the other point, okay? Look at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? God has set each member, each of them, in a body just as he pleased. They are all one member, where would we be? Indeed, there are many members, but there is one body. Now, look at verse 21. Now we look at it from the other perspective, okay? Verse 21, the eye, all right? Can the eye say to the hand, listen, I don't really need you, all right? Can your eye be so haughty to say, listen, I don't need a hand. Would you be okay cutting your hand off? No, you wouldn't. You want to keep your hand. And an eye is just not thinking. It's not the brain. The eye is just not thinking if it says, listen, I don't want the hand around here. Now look to the next point. Um, let me see. That may be as far as we go. I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to head to the feet, I have no need of you, because every part of it's important. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, even if you are an important person in the church, even if you're the rich guy, even if you're the eloquent guy, even if you're the heritage guy, don't look down on parts of the body that don't seem as pretty to you because you know what? They're needed even more or just as much. Now the even more part comes up. We start talking about baser parts of the body. Okay. Verse 22, no much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body having greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, the members should have the same care one for another. Okay, this is a fun part to illustrate. There's parts of our body that aren't as pretty as other parts of the body. But what do we do to the ugly parts of our body? You cover them up, and you really, really take care of them, right? Okay, I was joking with a fellow in the foyer right after the end of the sermon, and he said, Preacher, I tried to listen to your whole sermon, but my bladder just wouldn't let me. And I said, I fully understand. I said, you know, when I was younger, I'd always say, you know, the mind can only take what the seat can handle. And that has changed from I can only handle a sermon as long as my bladder will let me. You know, we're kind of talking about that. Well, you know, the bladder's not the prettiest part of the body, right? All that business that goes on with that. But as you get older, you start paying attention to bladder issues a little bit more than you would otherwise, right? That's usually not something we talk about in church. But you take care of those parts of the body because those parts of the body determine a long ways to where your health is. They're really important to you. You start paying attention to things a lot more than you used to. Um, when I was young, running and things such as that, I just got out of the car and started running, you know? Now, if you don't stretch for five or ten minutes, you're going to really, really hurt. You've got to take more care of your body as you age. And as parts of your body begin to have issues, you've got to take more care of those parts of the body. Now, Paul uses that illustration for what purpose? He's talking about how we treat one another in church. I can say, listen, you know what? I am the preacher. I get to preach the sermons. I actually got a Bible degree or a couple of those things. And God says, hey, that's good. But remember, you're just a part of the body. And God's care and concern oftentimes is not as much for the strong parts, the supposedly strong parts. Many of us preachers struggle spiritually just like anybody else. In fact, I think all of us struggle spiritually just like everybody else. God spends his time on the weaker parts. He spends his time taking care of the weaker ones. In Luke 15, parable of the Good Samaritan, is Jesus, when Luke 15 opens up, spending his time worried about the Sadducees and Pharisees, or is he worried about the tax collectors and the sinners? He's worried about the sinners, isn't he? Why? He cares about those baser parts, about the parts which you and I would say, they don't matter. They're not the big members of the church. God says, listen, they matter even more because they take more work, they take more concern, and I've got to work harder to keep them healthy and where they need to be. And so that's what we're pulling at when we're going through that. Does that make sense? Does that work all right? Now, what I also want to notice is this is a letter. 
1 Corinthians is meant to be read all at one time. Remember chapter 11, working with the Lord's Supper. You had some who were feasting and engorging themselves, and you had some who were starving. And yet some people were saying, listen, I am super important in church. And other people saying, eh, you know, I don't fit in here. I just, I'm not as good as everybody else. Chapter 12 comes, and what does Paul say? He's reinforcing what we just read in chapter 11, because he's saying, you know what? Every single one of us matter to God. And in fact, those that you and I may look down on, they are more important. They need extra care. And we have to work even harder to take care of them and help them to be exactly what God wants them to be. Okay? Now, 25, that there should be no what? Mine says schism or division. Is that what yours says? Schism, division, something like that. Okay. All right. There's parts of your body that when you were 20, you did not care about. It worked without a problem. Those parts of your body when you're 70, you got to worry about them sometimes, right? Make sure those parts of your body worked, right? Uh, blood pressure. Probably when you were a teenager, blood pressure was not an issue, okay? You get to be a little bit older, suddenly you got to be sure you took your pills, and you got to be sure of what you just ate, that you didn't eat too much salt, perhaps. Maybe the same thing with cholesterol. You probably didn't care about cholesterol when you were in your teens. Do you start caring about it when you're 50 or when you're 60? you got to start caring about those things. All right, in the same way, we've got to worry about the Lord's church. And we've got to take care of those weaker parts of our body because we don't want to have a division. We don't want to have a problem in the church. One interesting thing about my father, he passed away almost two years ago. It'll be two years ago in December. Uh, he, because of a uh, faulty blood transfusion he received back in the 80s, ended up with hepatitis C, which went to a lot of different things, liver cancer. He finally had a liver transplant. But one of the things the doctors told him when, uh, after he finished the transplant was it was kind of interesting. They said, you have a family history of heart disease, but you're never going to have heart disease because cholesterol is created from the liver and from that, that part of the body that we've taken out and that has been so diseased. And so for some reason, your heart, well, that, for that reason, your heart is super healthy. It's this other part we got to worry about. Well, you don't worry about the healthy parts of your body. You worry about the unhealthy parts of the body. And that's the part you take care of. That was right in the middle of an illustration. But the bell rang. Time. Just think, we'll get to heaven and I can preach forever. Oh, no, heaven won't be that way. You won't have to listen to my preaching. You'll be even better. All right. Thank you for being here. Huh? You ever think about unplugging that bell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Be sure tonight to get over there to the Carson Center. You will like this fella. He is a great guy.